Chapter 11 Psychotherapists or the Clergy It is the urgent psychic problems of patients, much more than the questions put by scientific workers, which have given effective impetus to the newer developments in medical psychology and psychotherapy. The science of medicine has avoided all contact with strictly psychic problems. It has held to this position in spite of the patient's urgent needs, but on the partly justified assumption that psychic problems belong to other fields of study. And yet it has been forced to widen its scope so as to include experimental psychology, just as it has been driven time and time again, in view of man's biological homogeneity, to borrow from such branches of science as chemistry, physics, and biology. It was natural that a new direction should be given to these adopted branches of science. We can characterize the change by saying that instead of being regarded as ends in themselves, they were valued because of their possible application to human beings. Psychiatry, for example, helped itself out of the treasure chest of experimental psychology and funded its borrowings in that inclusive body of knowledge called psychopathology, a general name for the study of complex psychic manifestations. Psychopathology is built for one part upon the findings of psychiatry in the strict sense of the term, and for the other upon the findings of neurology, a field of study which originally embraced the so-called psychogenetic neuroses, and still does so in academic parlance. In practice, however, a gulf has opened in the last few decades between the trained neurologist and the psychotherapist, this rift being traceable to the first researches in hypnotism. There was no preventing this divergence, for neurology is the study of organic nervous diseases in particular, while the psychogenetic neuroses are not organic diseases in the usual sense of the term. Nor do these neuroses fall within the realm of psychiatry, whose particular field of study is the psychoses, or mental diseases, for the psychogenetic neuroses are not mental diseases, as this term is commonly understood. Rather, do they constitute a special field by themselves, which has no hard and fast boundaries, and they show many transitional forms, which point in two directions, toward mental disease on the one hand, and disease of the nerves on the other. The unmistakable feature of the neuroses is the fact that their causes are psychic and that their cure depends entirely upon psychic methods of treatment. The attempts to delimit and to explore this special field, both from the side of psychiatry and from that of neurology, have led to a discovery which is very unwelcome to the science of medicine, namely the discovery that the psyche is an etiological or causal factor in disease. In the course of the 19th century, medicine shaped its methods and theory in such a way as to become one of the disciplines of natural science, and it also adopted the primary assumption of natural science, material causation. For medicine, the psyche did not exist in its own right, and experimental psychology also did its best to constitute itself a psychology without the psyche. Investigation, however, has established beyond a doubt that the crux of the psychoneuroses is to be found in the psychic factor, that this is the essential cause of the pathological state, and must therefore be recognized in its own right, along with other admitted pathogenic factors such as inheritance, disposition, bacterial infection, and so forth. All attempts to explain the psychic factor in terms of more elementary physical factors were doomed to failure. There was more promise in the attempt to delimit the psychic factor by the concept of the drive or instinct, a concept taken over from biology. It is well known that instincts are observable physiological urges which are traceable to the functioning of the glands, and that, as experience shows, they condition or influence psychic processes. What could seem more plausible, therefore, than to seek the specific cause of the psychoneuroses, not in the mystical notion of the soul, but in a disturbance of the impulses which might possibly be curable in the last resort by medicinal treatment of the glands. As a matter of fact, this is Freud's standpoint when establishing his well-known theory which explains the neuroses in terms of disturbances of the sexual impulse. Adler likewise resorts to the concept of the drive and explains the neuroses in terms of disturbances of the urge to power. We must admit, indeed, that this concept is further removed from physiology and is of a more psychic nature than that of the sexual drive. 
The concept of instinct is anything but well-defined in the scientific sense. It applies to a biological manifestation of great complexity and is not much more than a notion of quite indefinite content standing for an unknown quantity. I do not wish to enter here upon a critical discussion of the concept of instinct. Instead, I will consider the possibility that the psychic factor is just a combination of instincts which, for their part, may again be reduced to the functioning of the glands. We may even discuss the possibility that everything that is usually called psychic is embraced in the sum total of instincts, and that the psyche itself is therefore only an instinct or a conglomerate of instincts, being in the last analysis nothing but the functioning of the glands. A psychoneurosis would thus be a glandular disease. This statement, however, has not been proved, and no glandular extract that will cure a neurosis has as yet been found. On the other hand, we have been taught by all too many mistakes that organic medicine fails completely in the treatment of neuroses, while psychic methods cure them. These psychic methods are just as effective as we might suppose the glandular extracts would be. So far, then, as our present experience goes, neuroses are to be influenced or cured by considering them not from the side of their irreducible elements, the glandular secretions, but from that of psychic activity, which must be taken as a reality. For example, a suitable explanation or a comforting word to the patient may have something like a healing effect, which may even influence the glandular secretions. The doctor's words, to be sure, are only vibrations in the air, yet they constitute a particular set of vibrations corresponding to a particular psychic state in the doctor. The words are effective only in so far as they convey a meaning or have significance. It is their meaning which is effective, but meaning is something mental or spiritual. Call it a fiction if you like. Nonetheless, it enables us to influence the course of the disease in a far more effective way than with chemical preparations. We can even influence the biochemical processes of the body by it, whether the fiction arises in me spontaneously or reaches me from without by way of human speech, it can make me ill or cure me. Nothing is surely more intangible and unreal than fictions, illusions, and opinions, and yet nothing is more effective in the psychic and even the psychophysical realm. It was by recognizing these facts that science discovered the psyche, and we are now in honor bound to admit its reality. It has been shown that the drive, or instinct, is a condition of psychic activity, while at the same time the psychic processes seem to condition the instincts. It is no reproach to the Freudian and Adlerian theories that they are based upon the drives. The only trouble is that they are one-sided. The kind of psychology they represent leaves out the psyche and is suited to people who believe that they have no spiritual needs or aspirations. In this matter, both the doctor and the patient deceive themselves, although the theories of Freud and Adler come much nearer to getting at the bottom of the neuroses then does any earlier approach to the question from the side of medicine, they still fail because of their exclusive concern with the drives to satisfy the deeper spiritual needs of the patients. They are still bound by the premises of 19th century science, and they are too self-evident. They give too little value to fictional and imaginative processes. In a word, they do not give meaning enough to life, and it is only the meaningful that sets us free. Everyday reasonableness, sound human judgment, and science as a compendium of common sense certainly helps us over a good part of the road. Yet they do not go beyond that frontier of human life which surrounds the commonplace and matter-of-fact, the merely average and normal. They afford, after all, no answer to the question of spiritual suffering and its innermost meaning. A psychoneurosis must be understood as the suffering of a human being who has not discovered what life means for him. But all creativeness in the realm of the spirit, as well as every psychic advance of man, arises from a state of mental suffering, and it is spiritual stagnation, psychic sterility, which causes this state. The doctor who realizes this truth sees a territory opened before him, which he approaches with the greatest hesitation. He is now confronted with the necessity of conveying to his patient the healing fiction, the meaning that quickens, for it is this that the patient longs for over and above all that reason and science can give him.
The patient is looking for something that will take possession of him and give meaning and form to the confusion of his neurotic mind. Is the doctor equal to the task? To begin with, he will probably hand over his patient to the clergyman or the philosopher or abandon him to that perplexity which is the special note of our day. As a doctor, he is not required to have a finished outlook on life, and his professional conscience does not demand it of him. But what will he do when he sees only too clearly why his patient is ill, when he sees that it arises from his having no love but only sexuality, no faith because he is afraid to grope in the dark, no hope because he is disillusioned by the world and by life, and no understanding because he has failed to read the meaning of his own existence? There are many well-educated patients who flatly refuse to consult the clergyman. With the philosopher, they will have even less to do, for the history of philosophy leaves them cold, and intellectual problems seem to them more barren than the desert. And where are the great and wise men who do not merely talk about the meaning of life and of the world, but really possess it? Human thought cannot conceive any system or final truth that could give the patient what he needs in order to live, that is, faith, hope, love, and insight. These four highest achievements of human effort are so many gifts of grace, which are neither to be taught nor learned, neither given nor taken, neither withheld nor earned, since they come through experience, which is something given, and therefore beyond the reach of human caprice. Experiences cannot be made, they happen, yet fortunately their independence of man's activity is not absolute but relative. We can draw closer to them, that much lies within our human reach. There are ways which bring us nearer to living experience, yet we should beware of calling these ways methods. The very word has a deadening effect. The way to experience, moreover, is anything but a clever trick. It is rather a venture which requires us to commit ourselves with our whole being. Thus, in trying to meet the demands made upon him, the doctor is confronted by a question which seems to contain an insuperable difficulty. How can he help the sufferer to attain the liberating experience which will bestow upon him the four great gifts of grace and heal his sickness? We can, of course, advise the patient with the very best intentions that he should have true love, or true faith, or true hope, and we can admonish him with the phrase, Know thyself. But how is the patient, before he has come to experience, to obtain that which only experience can give him? Saul owed his conversion neither to true love, nor to true faith, nor to any other truth. It was solely his hatred of the Christians that set him upon the road to Damascus, and to that decisive experience which was to decide the whole course of his life. He was brought to this experience by following with conviction the course in which he was most completely mistaken. This opens up for us an approach to the problems of life which we can hardly take too seriously and it confronts the psychotherapist with a question which brings him shoulder to shoulder with the clergyman, the question of good and evil. It is in reality the priest or the clergyman, rather than the doctor, who should be most concerned with the problem of spiritual suffering. But in most cases, the sufferer consults the doctor in the first place, because he supposes himself to be physically ill, and because certain neurotic symptoms can be at least alleviated by drugs. But if, on the other hand, the clergyman is consulted, he cannot persuade the sick man that the trouble is psychic. As a rule, he lacks the special knowledge which would enable him to discern the psychic factors of the disease, and his judgment is without the weight of authority. There are, however, persons who, while well aware of the psychic nature of their complaint, nevertheless refuse to turn to the clergyman. They do not believe that he can really help them. Such persons distrust the doctor for the same reason, and they are justified by the fact that both doctor and clergyman stand before them with empty hands, if not, what is even worse, with empty words. We can hardly expect the doctor to have anything to say about the ultimate questions of the soul. It is from the clergyman, not from the doctor, that the sufferer should expect such help. But the Protestant clergyman often finds himself face to face with an almost impossible task, for he has to cope with practical difficulties that the Catholic priest is spared. Above all, the priest has the authority of his church behind him, and his economic position is secure and independent. 
This is far less true of the Protestant clergyman, who may be married and burdened with the responsibility of a family, and cannot expect, if all else fails, to be supported by his community or taken into a monastery. But the priest, if he is also a Jesuit, even has at his disposal the psychological teaching of the present day. I know, for instance, that my own writings were seriously studied in Rome long before any Protestant pastor thought them worthy of a glance. We have come to a serious pass. The exodus from the German Protestant Church is only one of many symptoms which should make it plain to the clergy that mere admonitions to believe, or to perform acts of charity, do not give modern man what he is looking for. The fact that many clergymen seek support or practical help from Freud's theory of sexuality or Adler's theory of power is astonishing, inasmuch as both these theories are hostile to spiritual values, being, as I have said, psychology without the psyche. They are rational methods of treatment which actually hinder the realization of meaningful experience. By far, the larger number of psychotherapists are disciples of Freud or of Adler. This means that the great majority of patients are necessarily alienated from a spiritual standpoint, a fact which cannot be a matter of indifference to one who has the realization of spiritual values much at heart. The wave of interest in psychology which at present is sweeping over the Protestant countries of Europe is far from receding. It is coincident with the general exodus from the church. Quoting a Protestant minister, I may say, Nowadays people go to the psychotherapist rather than to the clergyman. I am convinced that this statement is true only of relatively educated persons, not of mankind in the mass. However, we must not forget that it will be some twenty years before the ordinary run of people begin to think the thoughts of the educated person of today. For instance, Buchner's work, Force and Matter, became one of the most widely read books in German public libraries about twenty years after educated persons had begun to forget about it. I am persuaded that what is today a vital interest in psychology among educated persons will tomorrow be shared by everyone. I should like to call attention to the following facts. During the past thirty years, people from all the civilized countries of the earth have consulted me. I have treated many hundreds of patients, the larger number being Protestants, a smaller number Jews, and not more than five or six believing Catholics. Among all my patients in the second half of life, that is to say, over thirty-five, there has not been one whose problem in the last resort was not that of finding a religious outlook on life. It is safe to say that every one of them fell ill because he had lost that which the living religions of every age have given to their followers and none of them has been really healed who did not regain his religious outlook. This, of course, has nothing whatever to do with a particular creed or membership of a church. Here, then, the clergyman stands before a vast horizon, but it would seem as if no one had noticed it. It also looks as though the Protestant clergyman of today was insufficiently equipped to cope with the urgent psychic needs of our age, it is indeed high time for the clergyman and the psychotherapist to join forces to meet this great spiritual task. Here is a concrete example which goes to show how closely this problem touches us all. Somewhat more than two years ago, the leaders of the Christian Students' Conference at Aarau, Switzerland, laid before me the question whether people in spiritual distress prefer nowadays to consult the doctor rather than the clergyman, and what are the causes of their choice. This was a very direct and concrete question. At that time, I knew nothing more than the fact that my own patients obviously had consulted the doctor rather than the clergyman. It seemed to me to be open to doubt whether this was generally the case or not. At any rate, I was unable to give a definite reply. I therefore set on foot an inquiry, through acquaintances of mine, among people whom I did not know. I sent out a questionnaire which was answered by Swiss, German, and French Protestants, as well as by a few Catholics. The results are very interesting, as the following general summary shows. Those who decided for the doctor represented 57% of the Protestants and only 25% of the Catholics, while those who decided for the divine formed 8% of the Protestants and 58% of the Catholics. These were the unequivocal decisions. 
there were some 35% of the Protestants who could not make up their minds, while only 17% of the Catholics were undecided. The reason given for not consulting the minister of the church was generally his lack of psychological knowledge and insight, and this covered 52% of the answers. Some 28% were to the effect that he was prejudiced in his views and showed a dogmatic and traditional bias. Curiously enough, there was even one clergyman who decided for the doctor, while another made the irritated retort, theology has nothing to do with the treatment of human beings. All the relatives of clergymen who answered my questionnaire pronounced themselves against the clergy. Insofar as this enquiry was restricted to educated persons, it is only a straw in the wind. I am convinced that the uneducated classes would have reacted differently. But I am inclined to accept the results as a more or less valid indication of the views of educated people, the more so as it is a well-known fact that their indifference in matters of the church and religion is steadily growing. And we must not forget the truth of social psychology, to which I have already referred, that it takes about twenty years for a general outlook upon life to percolate down from the educated class to the uneducated masses. Who, for instance, would have dared to prophesy twenty years ago, or even ten, that Spain, the most Catholic of European countries, would undergo the unexampled spiritual transformation we are witnessing today? And yet it has broken out with the violence of a cataclysm. It seems to me that side by side with the decline of religious life, the neuroses grow noticeably more frequent. There are as yet no statistics which enable us to prove the increase in actual numbers. But of one thing I am sure, that everywhere the mental state of European man shows an alarming lack of balance. We are living undeniably in a period of the greatest restlessness, nervous tension, confusion, and disorientation of outlook. Among my patients from many countries, all of them educated persons, there is a considerable number who came to see me, not because they were suffering from a neurosis, but because they could find no meaning in life or were torturing themselves with questions neither present-day philosophy nor religion could answer. Some of them perhaps thought I knew of a magic formula, but I was soon forced to tell them that I, too, had no answer to give. And this brings us to practical considerations. Let us take, for example, that most ordinary and frequent of questions, what is the meaning of my life or of life in general? Men today believe that they know only too well what the clergyman will say, or rather must say to this. They smile at the very thought of the philosopher's answer, and in general do not expect much of the physician. But from the psychotherapist who analyzes the unconscious, from him one might doubtless learn something. He has perhaps dug up from the depths of his mind, among other things, a meaning for life which could be bought for a fee. It must be a relief to every serious-minded person to hear that the psychotherapist also does not know what to say. Such a confession is often the beginning of the patient's confidence in him. I have found that modern man has an eradicable aversion for traditional opinions and inherited truths. He is a Bolshevist for whom all the spiritual standards and forms of the past have lost their validity, and who therefore wants to experiment in the world of the spirit as the Bolshevist experiments with economics. When confronted with this modern attitude, every ecclesiastical system is in a parlous state, be it Catholic, Protestant, Buddhist, or Confucian. Among these moderns, there are, of course, certain of those denigrating, destructive, and perverse natures, unbalanced eccentrics, who are never satisfied anywhere and who therefore flock to every new banner, much to the hurt of these movements and undertakings, in the hope of finding something for once which will atone at a low cost for their own insufficiency. It goes without saying that, in my professional work, I have come to know a great many modern men and women, and such pathological pseudo-moderns among them. But I prefer to leave these aside. Those of whom I am thinking are by no means sickly eccentrics, but are most often exceptionally able, courageous, and upright persons who have repudiated our traditional truths for honest and decent reasons, and not from wickedness of heart. Every one of them has the feeling that our religious truths have somehow or other grown empty. Either they cannot reconcile the scientific and the religious outlooks, 
or Christian tenets have lost their authority and their psychological justification. People no longer feel themselves to have been redeemed by the death of Christ. They cannot believe, they cannot compel themselves to believe, however happy they may deem the man who has a belief. Sin has for them become something quite relative. What is evil for the one is good for the other. After all, why should not Buddha be in the right also? There is no one who is not familiar with these questions and doubts, yet Freudian analysis would brush all these matters aside as irrelevant. It holds the position that the basic problem is that of repressed sexuality, and that philosophical or religious doubts only mask the true state of affairs. If we closely examine the individual case, we do actually discover peculiar disturbances in the sexual sphere as well as in the sphere of the unconscious impulses in general. It is Freud's way to see in these disturbances an explanation of the psychic disturbance as a whole. He is interested only in the causal interpretation of the sexual symptoms. He completely overlooks the fact that, in certain cases, the supposed causes of the neurosis were always present, but had no pathological effect until a disturbance of the conscious attitude set in and led to a neurotic upset. It is as though, when a ship was sinking because of a leak, the crew only interested itself in the chemical constitution of the water that was pouring in. Disturbances in the sphere of the unconscious drives are not primary, but secondary phenomena. When conscious life has lost its meaning and promise, it is as though a panic has broken loose, and we heard the exclamation, Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. It is this mood, born of the meaninglessness of life, that causes the disturbance in the unconscious and provokes the painfully curbed impulses to break out anew. The causes of a neurosis lie in the present as well as in the past, and only a still existing cause can keep a neurosis active. A man is not tubercular because he was infected twenty years ago with bacilli, but because foci of infection are still active today. The questions when and how the infection took place are even quite irrelevant to his present condition. Even the most accurate knowledge of the previous history of the case cannot cure tuberculosis, and the same holds true of the neuroses. This is why I regard the religious problems which the patient brings before me as relevant to the neurosis and as possible causes of it. But if I take them seriously, I must admit to the patient that his feelings are justified. Yes, I agree, Buddha may be right as well as Jesus. Sin is only relative, and it is difficult to see how we can feel ourselves in any way redeemed by the death of Christ. As a doctor, I can easily admit these doubts, while it is hard for the clergyman to do so. The patient feels my attitude to be one of understanding, while the pastor's hesitation strikes him as a traditional prejudice, which estranges them from one another. He asks himself, what would the pastor say if I began to tell him of the painful details of my sexual disturbances? He rightly suspects that the pastor's moral prejudice is even stronger than his dogmatic bias. In this connection, there is a good story about the American president, Silent Cal Coolidge. When he returned after an absence one Sunday morning, his wife asked him where he had been. To church, he replied. What did the minister say? He talked about sin. And what did he say about sin? He was against it. It might be supposed that it is easy for the doctor to show understanding in this respect, but people forget that even doctors have moral scruples, and that certain patients' confessions are hard even for a doctor to swallow. Yet the patient does not feel himself accepted unless the very worst in him is accepted too. No one can bring this about by mere words. It comes only through the doctor's sincerity and through his attitude towards himself and his own evil side. If the doctor wants to offer guidance to another, or even to accompany him a step of the way, he must be in touch with this other person's psychic life. He is never in touch when he passes judgment. Whether he puts his judgment into words or keeps them to himself makes not the slightest difference. To take the opposite position and to agree with the patient offhand is also of no use, but estranges him as much as condemnation. We can get in touch with another person only by an attitude of unprejudiced objectivity. This may sound like a scientific precept, 
and may be confused with a purely intellectual and detached attitude of mind, but what I mean to convey is something quite different. It is a human quality, a kind of deep respect for facts and events and for the person who suffers from them, a respect for the secret of such a human life. The truly religious person has this attitude. He knows that God has brought all sorts of strange and inconceivable things to pass and seeks in the most curious ways to enter a man's heart. He therefore senses in everything the unseen presence of the divine will. This is what I mean by unprejudiced objectivity. It is a moral achievement on the part of the doctor, who ought not to let himself be repelled by illness and corruption. We cannot change anything unless we accept it. Condemnation does not liberate, it oppresses. I am the oppressor of the person I condemn, not his friend and fellow sufferer. I do not in the least mean to say that we must never pass judgment in the cases of persons whom we desire to help and approve. But if the doctor wishes to help a human being, he must be able to accept him as he is. And he can do this in reality only when he has already seen and accepted himself as he is. Perhaps this sounds very simple, but simple things are always the most difficult. In actual life, it requires the greatest discipline to be simple, and the acceptance of oneself is the essence of the moral problem and the epitome of a whole outlook upon life. That I feed the hungry, that I forgive an insult, that I love my enemy in the name of Christ, all these are undoubtedly great virtues. What I do unto the least of my brethren, that I do unto Christ. But what if I should discover that the least amongst them all, the poorest of all the beggars, the most impudent of all the offenders, the very enemy himself, that these are within me, and that I myself stand in the need of the alms of my own kindness, that I myself am the enemy who must be loved. What then? As a rule, the Christian attitude is then reversed. There is no longer any question of love or long-suffering. We say to the brother within us, Raka, and condemn and rage against ourselves. We hide it from the world. We refuse to admit ever having met this least among the lowly in ourselves. Had it been God Himself who drew near to us in this despicable form, we should have denied him a thousand times before a single cock had crowed. The man who uses modern psychology to look behind the scenes, not only of his patients' lives, but more especially of his own, and the modern psychotherapist must do this if he is not to be merely an unconscious fraud, will admit that to accept himself in all his wretchedness is the hardest of tasks, and one which is almost impossible to fulfill. The very thought can make us livid with fear. We therefore do not hesitate, but light-heartedly choose the complicated course of remaining in ignorance about ourselves, while busying ourselves with other people and their troubles and sins. This activity lends us an air of virtue, and we thus deceive ourselves and those around us. In this way, thank God, we can escape from ourselves. There are countless people who can do this with impunity, but not everyone can and these few break down on the road to Damascus and succumb to a neurosis. How could I help these persons if I am myself a fugitive, and perhaps also suffer from the sacred disease of a neurosis? Only he who has fully accepted himself has an unprejudiced objectivity. But no one is justified in boasting that he has fully accepted himself. We can point to Christ, who offered his traditional bias as a sacrifice to the God in himself, and so lived his life as it was to the bitter end without regard for conventions or for the moral standards of the Pharisees. We Protestants must sooner or later face this question. Are we to understand the imitation of Christ in the sense that we should copy his life and, if I may use the expression, ape his stigmata? Or in the deeper sense that we are to live our own proper lives as truly as he lived his in all its implications? It is no easy matter to live a life that is modeled on Christ's, but it is unspeakably harder to live one's own life as truly as Christ lived his. Anyone who did this would run counter to the forces of the past, and though he might thus be fulfilling his destiny, would nonetheless be misjudged, derided, tortured, and crucified. He would be a kind of mad Bolshevist who deserved the cross, we therefore prefer the historically sanctioned imitation of Christ which is transfigured by holiness.
I should never disturb a monk in his practice of identifying himself with Christ, for he deserves our respect. But neither I nor my patients are monks, and it is my duty as a physician to show my patients how they can live their lives without becoming neurotic. Neurosis is an inner cleavage, the state of being at war with oneself. Everything that accentuates this cleavage makes the patient worse, and everything that mitigates it tends to heal the patient. What drives people to war with themselves is the intuition or the knowledge that they consist of two persons in opposition to one another. The conflict may be between the sensual and the spiritual man, or between the ego and the shadow. It is what Faust means when he says, Two souls, alas, dwell in my breast apart. A neurosis is a dissociation of personality. Healing may be called a religious problem. In the sphere of social or national relations, the state of suffering may be civil war, and this state is to be cured by the Christian virtue of forgiveness for those who hate us. That which we try with the conviction of good Christians to apply to certain situations, we must also apply to the inner state in the treatment of neurosis. This is why modern man has heard enough about guilt and sin. He is sorely enough beset by his own bad conscience, and wants rather to learn how he is to reconcile himself with his own nature, how he is to love the enemy in his own heart and call the wolf his brother. The modern man, moreover, is not eager to know in what way he can imitate Christ, but in what way he can live his own individual life, however meager and uninteresting it may be. It is because every form of imitation seems to him deadening and sterile that he rebels against the force of tradition that would hold him to well-trodden ways. All such roads for him lead in the wrong direction. He may not know it, but he behaves as if his own individual life were instinct, with the will of God, which must at all costs be fulfilled. This is the source of his egoism, which is one of the most tangible evils of the neurotic state. But the person who tells him he is too egoistic has lost his confidence, and rightly so, for that person has driven him still further into his neurosis. If I wish to effect a cure for my patients, I am forced to acknowledge the deep significance of their egoism. I should be blind indeed if I did not recognize in it the true will of God. I must even help the patient to prevail in his egoism. If he succeeds in this, he estranges himself from other people. He drives them away, and they come to themselves as they should, for they were seeking to rob him of his sacred egoism. This must be left to him, for it is his strongest and healthiest power. It is, as I have said, a true will of God, which sometimes drives him into complete isolation. However wretched this state may be, it also stands him in good stead. For in this way alone can he take his own measure and learn what an invaluable treasure is the love of his fellow beings. It is, moreover, only in the state of complete abandonment and loneliness that we experience the helpful powers of our own natures. When one has several times seen this development take place, one can no longer deny that what was evil has turned to good, and that what seemed good has kept alive the forces of evil. The archdemon of egoism leads us along the royal road to that ingathering which religious experience demands. What we observe here is a fundamental law of life, in antiodromia, the reversal into the opposite, and this it is that makes possible the reunion of the warring halves of the personality and thereby brings the civil war to an end. I have taken the neurotic's egoism as an example because it is one of his most common symptoms. I might equally well have taken any other characteristic symptom to show what attitude the physician must adopt towards the shortcomings of his patients and how he must deal with the problem of evil. No doubt this also sounds very simple. In reality, however, the acceptance of the shadow side of human nature verges on the impossible. Consider for a moment what it means to grant the right of existence to what is unreasonable, senseless, and evil. Yet it is just this that the modern man insists upon. He wants to live with every side of himself, to know what he is. That is why he casts history aside. He wants to break with tradition so that he can experiment with his life and determine what value and meaning things have in themselves, apart from traditional presuppositions. Modern youth gives us astonishing examples of this attitude. 
To show how far this tendency may go, I will instance a question addressed to me by a German society. I was asked if incest is to be reprobated and what facts can be adduced against it. Granted such tendencies, the conflicts into which people may fall are not hard to imagine. I can well understand that one would like to leave nothing untried to protect one's fellow beings from such adventures. But curiously enough, we find ourselves without means to do this. All the old arguments against unreasonableness, self-deception, and immorality, once so potent, have lost their effectiveness. We are now reaping the fruit of 19th century education. Throughout that period, the Church preached to young people the merit of blind faith, while the universities inculcated an intellectual rationalism, with the result that today we plead in vain whether for faith or reason. Tired of this warfare of opinions, the modern man wishes to find out for himself how things are. And though this desire opens bar and bolt to the most dangerous possibilities, we cannot help seeing it as a courageous enterprise and giving it some measure of sympathy. It is no reckless adventure, but an effort inspired by deep spiritual distress to bring meaning once more into life on the basis of fresh and unprejudiced experience. Caution has its place, no doubt, but we cannot refuse our support to a serious venture which calls the whole of the personality into the field of action. If we oppose it, we are trying to suppress what is best in man, his daring and his aspiration. And should we succeed, we should only have stood in the way of that invaluable experience which might have given a meaning to life. What would have happened if Paul had allowed himself to be talked out of his journey to Damascus? The psychotherapist who takes his work seriously must come to grips with this question. He must decide in every single case whether or not he is willing to stand by a human being with the counsel and help upon what may be a daring misadventure. He must have no fixed ideas as to what is right, nor must he pretend to know what is right and what not, otherwise he takes something from the richness of the experience. He must keep in view what actually happens, and only that which acts is actual. If something which seems to me an error shows itself to be more effective than a truth, then I must first follow up the error. For in it lie power and life, which I lose if I hold to what seems to me true. Light has need of darkness, otherwise how could it appear as light? It is well known that Freudian psychoanalysis is limited to the task of making conscious the shadow side and the evil within us. It simply brings into action the civil war that was latent and lets it go at that. The patient must deal with it as best he can. Freud has unfortunately overlooked the fact that man has never yet been able, single-handed, to hold his own against the powers of darkness, that is, of the unconscious. Man has always stood in need of the spiritual help which each individual's own religion held out to him. The opening up of the unconscious always means the outbreak of intense spiritual suffering. It is as when a flourishing civilization is abandoned to invading hordes of barbarians, or when fertile fields are exposed by the bursting of a dam to a raging torrent. The World War was such an eruption which showed, as nothing else could, how thin are the walls which separate a well-ordered world from lurking chaos. But it is the same with every single human being and his reasonably ordered world. His reason has done violence to natural forces, which seek their revenge and only await the moment when the partition falls to overwhelm the conscious life with destruction. Man has been aware of this danger since the earliest times, even in the most primitive stages of culture. It was to arm himself against this threat and to heal the damage done that he developed religious and magical practices. This is why the medicine man is also the priest. He is the savior of the body as well as of the soul, and religions are systems of healing for psychic illness. This is especially true of the two greatest religions of man, Christianity and Buddhism. Man is never helped in his suffering by what he thinks for himself, but only by revelations of a wisdom greater than his own. It is this which lifts him out of his distress. Today, this eruption of destructive forces has already taken place, and man suffers from it in spirit. That is why patients force the psychotherapist into the role of a priest and expect and demand of him that he shall free them from their distress.
That is why we psychotherapists must occupy ourselves with problems which, strictly speaking, belong to the theologian. But we cannot leave these questions for theology to answer. The urgent psychic needs of suffering people confront us with them day after day, since as a rule, every concept and viewpoint handed down from the past fails us. We must first tread with the patient the path of his illness, the path of his mistake that sharpens his conflicts and increases his loneliness till it grows unbearable, hoping that from the psychic depths which cast up the powers of destruction, the rescuing forces will come also. When first I took this direction, I did not know where it would lead. I did not know what lay hid in the depths of the psyche, that region which I have since called the collective unconscious, and whose contents I designate as archetypes. Since time immemorial, eruptions of the unconscious have taken place, and ever and again they have repeated themselves. Consciousness did not exist from the beginning, and in every child it has to be built up anew in the first years of life. Consciousness is very weak in this formative period, and history shows us that the same is true of mankind. The unconscious easily seizes power. These struggles have left their marks. To put it in scientific terms, instinctive defense mechanisms have been developed which automatically intervene when the danger is greatest, and their coming into action is represented in fantasy by helpful images which are ineradicably fixed in the human psyche. These mechanisms come into play whenever the need is great. Science can only establish the existence of these psychic factors and attempt a rational explanation by offering an hypothesis as to their sources. This, however, only thrusts the problem a stage back and in no way answers the riddle. We thus come to those ultimate questions. Whence does consciousness come? What is the psyche? And at this point, all science ends. It is as though, at the culmination of the illness, the destructive powers were converted into healing forces. This is brought about by the fact that the archetypes come to independent life and serve as spiritual guides for the personality, thus supplanting the inadequate ego with its futile willing and striving. As the religious-minded person would say, guidance has come from God. With most of my patients, I have to avoid this formulation, for it reminds them too much of what they have to reject. I must express myself in more modest terms and say that the psyche has awakened to spontaneous life. And indeed, this formula more closely fits the observable facts. The transformation takes place at that moment when in dreams or fantasies, themes appear whose source and consciousness cannot be shown. To the patient, it is nothing less than a revelation when, from the hidden depths of the psyche, something arises to confront him, something strange that is not the I and is therefore beyond the reach of personal caprice. He has gained access to the sources of psychic life, and this marks the beginning of the cure. This process, if it is to be made clear, should undoubtedly be discussed with the help of suitable examples but it is almost impossible to find one or more convincing illustrations, for it is usually a most subtle and complicated matter. That which is so effective is often simply the deep impression made on the patient by the independent way in which his dreams treat of his difficulties. Or it may be that his fantasy points to something for which his conscious mind was quite unprepared. Most often it is contents of an archetypal nature, connected in a certain way, that exert a strong influence of their own, whether or not they are understood by the conscious mind. This spontaneous activity of the psyche often becomes so intense that visionary pictures are seen or inner voices heard. These are manifestations of the spirit directly experienced today, as they have been from time immemorial. Such experiences reward the sufferer for the pains of the labyrinthine way. From this point forward, a light shines through his confusion. He can reconcile himself with the warfare within, and so come to bridge the morbid split in his nature upon a higher level. The fundamental problems of modern psychotherapy are so important and far-reaching that their discussion in an essay precludes any presentation of details, however desirable this might be for clarity's sake. My main purpose was to set forth the attitude of the psychotherapist in his work, 
a proper understanding of this is after all more rewarding than to call a few precepts and pointers as to methods of treatment. For these are in any case not effective unless they are applied with the right understanding. The attitude of the psychotherapist is infinitely more important than the theories and methods of psychotherapy, and that is why I have been concerned to make this attitude known. I believe that I have given a trustworthy account. As for the questions in what way and how far the clergyman can join the psychotherapist in his efforts and endeavors, I can only impart information which will allow others to decide. I also believe that the picture I have drawn of the spiritual outlook of modern man corresponds to the actual state of affairs, though of course I make no claim to infallibility. In any case, what I have had to say about the cure of the neuroses and the problems involved is the unvarnished truth. We doctors would naturally welcome the sympathetic understanding of the clergy in our endeavors to heal psychic suffering, but we are also fully aware of the fundamental difficulties which stand in the way of a full cooperation. My own position is on the extreme left wing of the Congress of Protestant Opinion, yet I would be the first to warn people against generalizing from their own experience in an injudicious way. As a Swiss, I am an inveterate Democrat, yet I recognize that nature is aristocratic and, what is even more, esoteric. What is permitted for Jove is not permitted for oxen, is an unpleasant but an eternal truth. Who are forgiven their many sins? Those who have loved much, but as to those who love little, their few sins are held against them. I am firmly convinced that a vast number of people belong to the fold of the Catholic Church and nowhere else, because they are most suitably housed there. I am as much persuaded of this as of the fact, which I have myself observed, that a primitive religion is better suited to primitive people than Christianity, which is so incomprehensible to them and so foreign to their blood that they can only ape it in a disgusting way. I believe, too, that there must be Protestants against the Catholic Church, and also Protestants against Protestantism, for the manifestations of the Spirit are truly wondrous, and as varied as creation itself. The living Spirit grows and even outgrows its earlier forms of expression. It freely chooses the men in whom it lives and who proclaim it. This living Spirit is eternally renewed and pursues its goal in manifold and inconceivable ways throughout the history of mankind. Measured against it, the names and forms which men have given it mean little enough. They are only the changing leaves and blossoms on the stem of the eternal tree. This is Christopher Prince for University Press Audiobooks. Thank you for listening. This audiobook, Modern Man in Search of a Soul, by C. G. Jung, is copyrighted in 2011 in the name of Redwood Audiobooks and Christopher Prince, and is based on a series of lectures from Carl Jung, originally.